All right guys, quick hit video today. Best practices for how to treat your beer when you get it. There is no user manual. If you buy a treehouse beer and you keep it cold and you pour it into whatever type of glass you'd like to pour it into, you're likely to have a really awesome experience. The tips in this video and the information that I'm about to share might just make it that much better if you want to put a little bit more time and energy into it and maybe impress your friends at the bottle share with a little bit of extra knowledge. 99% of the beer that we produce is packaged cold and we want you and need you to keep it cold at all times. It is a perishable product, it's a natural product, it's a live product, always unfiltered here at Treehouse. So every can that you have has a, a very small but impactful amount of yeast in it. So we worry less about oxidation in the can and more about setting off a re-fermentation for the minute amount of sugars that a dry hop might put into the can or something like that. So re-ferment after we've crashed and kept this beer super cold will affect the flavor of our beer. So if you've ever had a treehouse beer from across the country and said, gee, this is maybe not what I expected, if it was shipped and it wasn't maintaining its cold chain management at all times, that will affect the flavor profile and it will also shorten the life of that beer that we've worked so hard to put perfectly into these cans. So keep your beer cold and drink it as freshly as possible. You'll be rewarded with better beer every time. All right, so pouring practices. Uh, glassware selection, different glassware for different beers can be super important or it can really not be that big of a deal. But for the purposes of today's video, I'm just gonna present two glasses. One is the classic Willie Becker, which is a you know, smaller pint glass. And then the classic Tiku glass, which we have right here. And for me, the difference between these two glasses is for this glass, if you're wanting to get a little bit more aromatics and sort of enjoy that beer, become more expressively as you work your way through the glass, this is the glass for you. If you just want a beautiful glass of beer that you want to pound and not think too much about it, for me, the Willie Becker is ideal. Uh, and the Tiku, for me, is ideal for beers that are over 6.5%, getting into double IPA territory. It's always nice to get those extra hop aromatics and character to open up in the glass by giving it a little bit of a swirl. So I'll show you guys what a simple pour will look like with Eureka. And again, it's, it's not rocket science. We could get deep into the details of the why uh, and how to pour, but for me, it's really pretty straightforward. You just want to go kind of at a 45 degree angle and cascade into the side of the glass there. If your head's too big, you can drop the, the can down. If it's too small, you can lift it up to create a little bit more foam. And then as you get toward the end, you kind of pour into the center and drop it down. And so right there, you have yourself a super straightforward, beautiful, wonderful, delicious glass of Eureka. All right, so what's a pour look like into a Tiku glass? I've got Jubilee here, which is another beer that features Peacherine. This one's on the double IPA end of things. And again, it's not every day that we introduce a new batch of Eureka with a new hop. And it's certainly not every day that we introduce a beer that we feel is worthy of our core series, uh, which is what we've done in Jubilee. So same thing, uh, in the, into the Tiku glass, just kind of pour at a slight angle there. If you're not getting enough head to your liking, you can raise the glass up or raise the can up. If you're getting too much, you can drop it down. And then as you get toward the end, you want to be real subtle. Pour right down the center. Form yourself a two, two and a half finger head and let it settle out. Boom, lovely, delightful pour of Jubilee. One other thing to talk about is how you treat your cans before you pour them. In the case of hoppy beer, there's a lot of information out there in terms of should I roll it, should I not roll it, should I shake it, what should I do? And that's truly up to the individual. For, for me personally, uh, if I use a beer like Hayes or Julius, for example, and I put that beer into the fridge for three weeks and then I go to pour it, if there's any sediment in the can, which there will be, it's natural, it's unfermented, it's unfiltered, it's uncentrifuge beer, and it's perishable, there'll be a little bit of sediment sometimes that settles to the bottom of the can. And if you leave it in the fridge for several weeks, that beer is gonna get like salsa that you make fresh. It's gonna kind of meld together and just kind of get better over time before it crescendos and then there's diminishing returns to how long you wanna hold on to it. There's conflicting opinions as to whether or not you should or shouldn't shake that beer. And for me, I don't ever roll or shake the beer, but if you'd like to, it'll stir up some of that sediment that gives the beer that super fresh, vibrant character that some people prefer. And for some beers, like the beer Bright, if you want the beer to be slightly translucent or even hazy, the reason the beer is called Bright is because over time it drops so that it's perfectly clear. 
you don't want that experience, you can give the can a gentle roll, let it settle for a minute before pouring it, crack it open and then pour it. And when you do that, you're gonna revive that beautiful translucent character if that's what you want. You may not want that, and if that's the case, be careful not to agitate the can too much before you pour it. We have Surfcaster here, and Surfcaster is a wit beer. And wit beer is the perfect example of a beer that you may want to stir up while you pour it into the glass because any amount of yeast or sediment in that can actually contributes to the flavor profile of this beer in ways that are classic. So these two cans haven't been disturbed all that much, and I'm going to see if there's any difference here when I pour them. So this can we haven't really disturbed and I'm gonna pour it in there like so. And right now this beer is pouring pretty clear for a wit. But what you'll find is, if you do that, and then you take this last little section, you give it a little swirl, really gently. Try not to create too much foam. You're really just trying to get that sediment to be fluid because it settles like cake on the bottom of the can. And then you pour the rest in and that portion is much, much darker and turbid. And it's gonna make that beautiful beer, that hazy, delicious wit beer that we've come to love so much. So again, this is personal preference. You may want this beer to be bright and clean because it tastes different to you and it tastes cleaner and brighter. Or you might want that little bit of yeast character alongside it, and that's entirely personal preference. For me, I'm shaking this can every time and I'm getting that haze in suspension because that's flavor and it's good flavor. So there you have it. And the same thing will happen with a batch of Bright and even the same thing will happen with a batch of Double IPA even though it may not be as pronounced. You might go from having like a certain shade of orange to a slightly lighter, more opaque shade of orange when you give a beer like Jubilee that's been sitting in your fridge for five to six weeks a very gentle swirl or roll before you pour it. It's all personal preference, guys. We're having fun. Slow pour is a technique that enables a super, super rocky head that sticks around for the entirety of the pour and tastes almost like meringue. So I'll try to do it on camera. We're probably gonna have to edit this a little bit because it takes a while. Uh, that's why they call it a slow pour. I don't think you guys wanna watch me sit here for the next five minutes. So you pour pretty aggressively right into the center of the glass. Try to create super rocky foam as you do so. And then right before the top, you kind of let it go. And then we wait. So yeah, as, as this begins to make its way up the glass, you just kind of add more. And you add more right down the center. And you've created that rocky head during the first part of your pour. And what you'll wind up with as you get toward the tail end is you'll get this super dense foam that you couldn't have created any other way than doing this super aggressive pour to start. So that head that you're gonna wind up with was actually created during that first portion of the pour and you're really just gently topping beer up from the bottom and trying to get fully carbonated beer through that head so that you have a layer of meringue foam on top and then you know carbonated beer below. It does take a while. On draft, depending on you know, the head retention of your beer, Sometimes the more aggressive foam, it can take you five, six minutes to create one of these pours, uh, which in the case of a can, I think it's probably gonna take us two to three minutes. So again, we wait. All right, so here we go. Another round of pouring. It's cool too, because the rockiness of the foam enables it to billow over the top of the glass, which if you were doing a regular pour, it would be impossible to do so. So we can actually put the two side by side which could be interesting. Just do kind of a standard pour here with Eureka Peacherine. Put the two side by side. And both look great, but you know, there's something about the slow pour that just looks more appealing. Kind of the dense bubbles in here. You know, this is not the most ideal head here on your right, my left. Whereas the slow pour creates something that's much more visually appealing and this last little bit is gonna be the end of the pour. Last thing that I wanna talk about here is in the, into the Tiku, we've got some Juice Project Citra, Citra, Citra here. You can, you can do kind of a half pour and you'll wanna keep some of that, you know, you wanna keep the carbonation in the beer and just allow a little bit of head to form. So you keep your pour really close down low to the glass and the, just a little bit of head form. And what you'll be able to do here 
is appreciate the aromatics of this beer by leaving yourself some headspace. So if you're drinking at home, uh, especially if you're drinking outside, when you're drinking, I strongly encourage you to keep this beer out of direct sunlight. Direct sunlight will instantly oxidize this beer and change the flavor profile. So if you pour that beer with two billowing of a head, that volatile organic material is gonna off gas and you're gonna lose those aromatics. Where if you do a really gentle pour, those aromatics stay locked up until you decide to unleash them like that with a little swirl. That smells wonderful, like orange marmalade. Oh, that's nice. All right, guys, so we worked super hard to make these beers as good as they can possibly be. And with a few simple steps, your experience will always be better. Uh, keep the beer cold at all times, and you are 95% of the way there. And then how you want to experience the beer is entirely up to you. Uh, if you want to pour it into a, a frosted glass or if you want to pour it into a boot chalice, that's entirely up to you, but we believe that the beer can be elevated by using traditional glassware that enhances the best attributes of the beer. So hopefully you learned something today. We appreciate you guys watching. Certainly subscribing to the channel helps us. So if you haven't done that, there's a button right below that says subscribe. If you click on that, you'll get the latest updates and the videos that we make. And that's helpful to us as is commenting. So we appreciate your comments as well. So thank you guys for watching. Take care and we'll see you next time.